Wishing for a body wash made with natural ingredients? Dr. Squatch has got you covered. Manly scents that make you irresistible? A thick lather that leaves your skin moisturized all day? No matter what you're looking for in a body wash, rest assured, Dr. Squatch is your best bet. Pick up one today in store or at drsquatch.com. It's Dr. Squatch Body Wash for men who prefer natural. Empire. Oh my God. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Carmen Report wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media, AMPIRE. Always much appreciated when you tune in and you can read my work on ESPN.com. And I think you're going to want to read this one, folks. Because Courtney Cronin, our Bears reporter, and I did an oral history of that last play. It's up on ESPN.com. Give it a read. I've never seen anything like it, folks. I have covered this team for many, many years, and I do not think I've ever seen, I've never seen anything like that. I've never witnessed a, a, a situation like that. Haven't heard a roar of a crowd very often like that, or seen a seen a scene like that at the end of a game where an improbable win. They had a 1.4% chance of winning the game going into the final play. And they did it. A Hail Mary pass from Jaden Daniels. You see how special that kid is. And I think you're seeing how special this team is becoming. They're now 6-2. and two, And folks, stuff like this happens. And you just got to say, something's going on here. And Bram Weinstein, the voice of commanders, and I, we he talked about this. We talked about this several weeks ago after that Bengals game, after that Cardinals game, that there's something that, like that Bengals game was the start of something. And now you're starting to see it play out week after week against, you know, anybody really, except for Baltimore. But this is just an improbable, very special moment that anybody who was inside the stadium will never forget. That includes players, that includes coaches, that includes fans, that includes the media folks, because, you know, I, again, I've seen every game at the stadium since it's open and you know, there aren't many, the Sean Taylor game against Dallas, Robert Griffin, the third run against uh, Minnesota that, you know, Robert Jackson inter- uh, sealing the intercept or with an interception to seal a win over Dallas and they win the division. There aren't many moments that you can look at here and say, Oh my gosh, what a moment. This is not RFK. This is the moment because of who it is and because of what they did. And you know, again, six and two, and it's Jaden Daniels playing with the rib injury, all this stuff. And as Sam Cosby said after the game, he's like, this is stuff you see in movies. And he's right. Like, this is why it was so cool. So you're, let's, I don't even know where to go with this because it's so incredible what they did. But I'm going to take you inside the locker room for a couple of minutes and then we'll go on to some more about this. But we're, I'm sitting there, you know, you're walking around the locker room, sitting over, you're over by the offensive lineman area. And you see, and I'm right by Nick Allegretti and Tyler Biotis as they're rewatching the play on Biotis's phone. And I kind of said something to Allegretti, like, how many times have you seen it or how many times are you going to watch it? He goes, I'm going to watch this at least a dozen more times. They'd already watched it. These guys, you know, Terry McLaurin's talking about watching a replay in the locker room as well and watching the linemen blow guys, you know, to the ground and stuff like this is the kind of game that just like, they just shake their heads in amazement. Like they were part of this and the excitement in there and this, the look on the on Terry McLaurin's face as he's talking about it and just the smile on his face, talking about his embrace with Dan Quinn after the game on the field and just how Dan Quinn is his kind of coach. And he's like, and I, and I'm a Dan Quinn kind of guy. Like he knows what he means to this team, but also like that he, they know what is a Dan Quinn guy. That's Terry McLaurin. It's guys like, shoot, you got a dozens of them in this locker room. Um, but man, this was just so unexpected. So that's why, like, it's hard to find a better moment than this that's happened in this stadium. Some other, like I, I pointed out a couple, but it's hard to top that moment. And again, part of it is because of what I think is starting to build here and, and it's just continuing to build. And I'm sure that some people are going to say, oh, the Bears are piped on already. But this is this was incredible. And you have the poise of Jaden Daniels. And that's one of the things that someone else was saying too in the locker room, like 
I think it was Zach Ertz was saying they don't consider him a rookie by technically he is a rookie because that's what he is in this league, but he acts like he's been in the league for 10 years and you see it on that last play, the poise he had. So on this, let's set up this last play. So on the play, like they obviously practice this play and they made a big deal out of saying like, you know, McLaurin's like we practice every week. Well, teams always practice that play. Right. And um, in, a, in a practice, like you're, you know, I even asked him, well, does it work in practice? I said, well, when they practice it, they'll practice for an O and a D perspective. So when it's the O, they, the defense lets them tip it. And so they can practice where guys are supposed to be and they catch the ball. Like when it's defensively, they let them knock the ball down, but they set it up and they execute right. So there is, there was the poise on Daniel's part to buy time to get them to set up in the right spot. So you see, you see, um, so what they want to do is set up a diamond formation. You had two guys are like the tip guys is Zach Ertz. You have Luke McCaffrey is in that middle too. You have Noah Brown who goes behind. You have Terry McLaurin who, if you're looking at the play is on the left-hand side, almost like a diamond formation. So, but, but Daniels had to buy time to get them into that spot. So you had McCaffrey and, and Ertz running into the end zone and then coming back out to be the tip guys. And Ertz is the number one tip guy. And that's why Daniel's kind of bouncing around. You're watching like, oh my God, he's going to, he's going to end up getting sacked. Well, he didn't, he bought the time, but he didn't hurry it. He didn't panic. Buys the time, gets some good blocks. And he just heaved it down the field and it went to the exact right spot and it gets tipped and it goes into Noah Brown's arms. Just incredible. So a couple of things like while Washington was keeping its head about itself, you had Chicago bears, um, corner Tyreek Stevenson as the ball is being snapped there's video whoever shot the video from the stands shout out to you I wish I wish I had your name in front of me right now but you have the great video because you got Stevenson is taunting the crowd he's looking at the crowd as the play is starting to unfold that's an unbelievably immature selfish play or, uh, selfish situation now he later tweeted an apology for it good for him but man, was that like, you talk about lo one team losing their head in that moment and the other team maintaining theirs. They executed a perfect from the poise of Daniels to the execution of the guys down the field. It worked exactly how it should. Now, you don't usually see it work that well, but they executed it perfectly. And, and that's why. And then again, Noah Brown in the absolute right spot. And it's kind of funny. He catches it. And it's almost like he just caught a ball in practice. He just kind of catches it, turns and goes to the back of the end zone as Terry McLaurin jumps on his back. And, um, you know, and then like Jaden, Jaden Daniels, we asked him after the game, what he saw is like, he didn't know what happened. What they, he and like other guys like Nick Allegretti is lying on the ground. He sees it on the screen. And then um, he, um, he said, he didn't even know who caught it until like three minutes later. He had uh, Austin Eckler talking about hearing the sound of the crowd and just, what a special moment that was and how he'll never forget that moment. And he's like, you know, and Jane Dow's like, he knew it was a touchdown when he heard the crowd and then he could see everybody pouring off the sideline, rushing it. And, and it's, it's an, inc it was an incredible scene um, to witness, but to, for them to be a part of that is just astounding. And like for guys like McLaurin, guys who have been here for a few years to be a part of that, my man, like you, you have to feel really good for, him for McLaurin for Sam Cosme guys who have been through the trust way guys who have been through a bunch of crap here and are now on the other side of that and they are it's so well deserved but again they practice to play all the time but and they they're really good at practicing situational football but this is beyond that right and and again I'm gonna bet that every team practices that play don't know for sure but it would make sense um but what I, again what I liked is they kept their poise about them when they went out and did it. Um, and yeah. And meanwhile, Tyreek Stevenson did not. And the other thing is like this, you have to, even Austin Eckler said, cause we we're talking to him. He's like, what did you think going into that drive? He's like, well, you know, give it a shot. It's a long shot, but you never know. But reality is you kind of think like, this is a major long shot but they get a completion. And then the big one was, the, I think it was a 13 yarder to McLaurin. He gets out of bounds with like three seconds left. That was the play that set up this one. So that was the, that was as big a play as any, because if you don't get that play, you're not completing that Hail Mary pass. So that one was huge. They didn't huddle after that. Cause I even said, what was said in the huddle? So I forget they didn't huddle. And because they knew what they had to do. And, and, 
you know, and they did it. And this is when you, one of the things that was evident throughout the summer, throughout the spring was how tight this group is. And that, and you knew that that was an intangible that a team could build on, but there's no way that I thought they'd be six and two at this point sitting here. I mean, I mean, who, who do you, who do you fear in the NFC East? You shouldn't fear anybody. And I mean, and then the NFC, like obviously Detroit's really good. You have Minnesota's a good team, but man, there's something with this group. And I think that's the thing that they're, they continue to build upon and, and you see it all the time and you see that hear the evidence of it all the time you see it all the time and i think it's why like when things like this happen you have to start to say like hey sometimes you just roll with it and it's and it becomes that kind of a season where you say i don't know how it happened but it did but then on the other hand you see what Jaden daniels does here's a guy that was you didn't know if he was going to play and i think it was dan quinn said he knew on saturday that he was that he was going to play or that he was good enough to play. And they liked what they saw on Friday. And even, you know, uh, Marcus Mariota was saying in the locker room afterwards that he what they saw on Friday was like, he looked good. He looks ready. And then it's just a matter of, is it, how does it respond the next day? And when it responds well, then you know. And I remember talking to people, you know, people who know Jaden Daniels, like they kind of figured, I think that he was going to play because they know him. They've, they've seen him play through the worst. They've, you know, and and they just know the kind of person he is and what he's going to try and do. So I don't think anybody who knows him is is all that surprised at what he was able to do today. And listen, he didn't shy away from anything either. Like that's the other part of this. He's playing with that hurt rib. There were definitely times he's getting up where he's shaken up, and and it's like you look at like look at him like, I mean, he took some. She took a couple shots to the side of the body where the ribs are hurt. And it was just, it, you get up like, how is he going to, what's he going to do? And he gets back up and plays the next play. And you could tell there were a couple of times, a little bit ginger walking off the field and just, you could tell that he was feeling it and he, but it didn't, deter, it didn't deter him from playing the way he needed to play. If he needed to pick up, try and get yards for a first down, he was going to turn up. He wasn't just going to run out of bounds to avoid contact you're out there playing, you're going to play a certain way. That's why they have him. And, you know, you want to be smart. And there were a couple of times you ran out of bounds when he needed to, right? When it was the right time. But man, in this game, you needed extra yards. He was going to try and get those. And he was going to hang in the pocket to get them as well. So it, I think that's where you see like, and if you're a, a teammate of his, you're going to appreciate that level of, of, of the kind of competitor he is. But I, I'll be honest, like nobody in there is going to be surprised by that because it's just what he does. And I even said to someone who's close to them, like kind of thought he, I thought he would play and I thought he'd have a big game because that's the kind of talent he is. And I go back to that Florida game he played last year. I wrote an oral history on that um, a month ago where misses the whole week with the con in concussion protocol goes out and has a record setting day in the sec, not an easy thing to do. And it's all, it goes back to the preparation that he does and, and, and all that. And he was, what his numbers today, I mean, in terms of accuracy, wasn't his most accurate game, 21 for 38, 326 yards with 52 of those coming at the end and a touchdown. But he also ran the ball, what he run the ball, um, eight times for 52 yards. Again, doesn't shy away from anything despite the rib injury and despite just knowing that it had to bother him a great deal. And I, I just, I can't say enough about what he did in this you know, um, it was, it was amazing. And I think again, like teammates notice that stuff and I'm looking for his quotes to see, trying to remember what he even said after the game, because everything's kind of a blur. Um, and let me find those if I can, I don't think I have them here with me, but it was the, the funny thing is like, he's just kind of a, he, he's kind of nonplussed about it. Right. He's not, he's not someone who's like, He's like, I was just running around buying time. And that's what he wanted to do. I said, there's, I asked him, is there a feel for when you have to throw the ball? He's like, no feeling. You just got to buy the time and you put it up there. And that's, that's what he was doing. So. Hey, it's Bram Weinstein here, voice of the commanders. And of course, frequent guest of this podcast, the John Kime Report. I wanted to let you all know that my show, which airs at 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. on ESPN 630, is now exclusively produced by Empire Media, my company, and is going to be 
distributed through our network. So I'm asking you, please, if you subscribe to this show and love this show, give mine a try as well. Subscribe to The Bram Weinstein Show wherever you get your podcasts. And many of the shows and many of the elements that are in the show will be available on the Empire Media YouTube channel. We're going to talk a ton of commanders and other DC sports. Check it out. By the way, and so this is from him and his next gen stats from ESPN Research. He's now thrown four touchdown passes that had a 30 that had less than a 30% chance of success rate this season. He's just different. The Bengals one was one of them, and there's a obviously four of them. That's different. So, and it's funny because going against on the other side with Caleb Williams, and I thought I thought the commanders did a really good job against Caleb Williams for most of that game. I mean, he hurt him more with his legs than he did with his arm. And then he got hot after that DeAndre Swift touchdown. You could just see something switch, you know, a flip switch for the Bears offense. And they got hot and Caleb Williams got hot and you saw his talent as well. But, you know, I don't think there's anybody in this town that's going to want anybody other than number five as their quarterback. That's not even a knock on Caleb Williams. It's just to say like, kid's special. And um, you know, Caleb Williams had made some special plays for sure. And he had a couple of throws. You're like, how did he get that out? How did he get out of this pocket? How did he get out of this? And, you know, and, but early on, I felt like he was way, you know, definitely off target for a lot of the game. He's just off target, whether it was feeling sped up by the pass rush a um, couple of times where it looked like, and they were able, they did a good job containing him in the pocket. Frankie Lou, who I think made life difficult for him at times. Um, <clears throat> but he still was able to emerge and make plays and put the bears in position where they really should have won the game. Um, but Daniels is just Daniels. Um, you know, and you, I mean, I, again, let's, let's go back to the locker room and, and talking again, talking, talking to Austin Eckler, where it's just the moment was such a big one. And I just, I don't think that anybody will, you know, here, here's the funny thing is like, I talk, Sam Cosme said, he goes, he goes, I just said, what did you do? He goes, I hugged a guy. I started, I hugged a guy in a black Jersey. Do you know who it was? I have no idea who it was. That's how excited and how lost in the moment they were. And, you know, I'm going to, I, I want to talk more about the game, but really it's how do you go away from this moment? And, you know, listening to the crowd and watching the crowd and the unbridled joy. And of course there were a decent number of bears fans here who were obviously devastated not that anybody here is going to care about that and then listening listening to the crowd as they leave the stadium one of my one thing i like to do is tape and put it tape that tape the video of that and put it up on twitter because i think it's fun for people to see but it really highlights the excitement that's going on here and just the vibes but something like this like you know if anybody left the game before that you know heaven you know it's too bad for them but because they would have missed a, a special special moment um now, I will say this game should have been put away long before that. The, this would have been a devastating loss, not because it was a loss to the Bears. The Bears are a good team, but because they were firmly in control for three quarters until the DeAndre Swift touched them. But they put themselves in that position because they continued to hurt themselves in the red zone. And that red zone offense has got to get more consistent, but it's also, you know, Trent Scott with two penalties inside there, two false starts. Like those are killers. This team is not, has not proven they can overcome the penalties in the red zone that happened against the giants. It happened today. They also had Sam Cosme blocking downfield on the pat, the touchdown pass to Olamide Zacchaeus and Cosme's four or five yards downfield. You've got to have more presence of mind than that. And it's funny because that didn't even come up after the game when I talked to him, because you kind of forget, but in high, but looking at it now, like why were they even in this position? And it's because the failed red zone trips and you know, you had Zach Ertz with almost making a really good catch in the end zone, but not controlling it. Now the, the officials, the officials said we had a pool reporter on that. Nikki Javala was the pool reporter on that. And the I'm going to read you what they said on that. So the ruling on the field was an incomplete pass of the challenge. Um, they needed clear and obvious video evidence that he actually had control of the ball before it hit the ground. When the ball came to the ground, we had hand separation off of the ball. Therefore, it's an incomplete pass. Um, 
the official said there were two different angles used and he didn't have his hand completely under the ball. Then you look at right after the hand and ball had contact with the ground, his hands were off the ball momentarily. So that's why it was ruled an incomplete catch or an incomplete pass. Bottom line is he couldn't control it. And it was another um, missed opportunity in the red zone. That's it's two games now where they've had that. And it's two games where they've actually won despite that. Then you look at the Bears' own miscue in the red zone, which is handing the ball to a freaking lineman inside the one. And I, you know, it's funny because I saw that formation with them watching their game film. And you wonder about that. It's not Fridge Perry, folks. So I don't think they're going to be doing that play again, but that that certainly saved um, the commanders there. And, and Johnny Newton, who had a terrific game, recovers that ball. And You know, and it's funny when you do a game like this, so for as a reporter, you have to prepare for multiple scenarios in the end of a game like that. We have to file takeaways for ESPN, and there are three different categories, and like you have different things, big question, you know, describe the game, this and that. And so like I had it all set. After three quarters, it was all set. Like, here's what I'm going to do. And then it's like, okay, well, now you got to account for the Bears scoring a touchdown. It's like, oh, no, this game could change. And then, so you have it shifting to the bear, you know, a different way. And then at the gun, it goes that way. And so it's really, it's kind of a chaotic few, chaotic final quarter there and certainly chaotic final few minutes. Um, but for everybody, it's funny because um, going back to um, just some of what the defense was able to do against Caleb Williams and and for the most of the game, um, but I'm going to go to Frankie Louvre too. And I want to read you some of the stuff that he had to say, like with Caleb Williams said, we knew we would to keep it in a phone booth for him, make him scramble around. He likes to lose ground a lot, make him get out of the pocket and throw it out. So we kind of got to our game plan, executed what we can. We did our thing. They still scored at the end. That's not acceptable for us on defense. Just got to keep stacking them up. But listen, man, that's two solid games in a row for the defense. Like I know Carolina is not a good team, but the offense, it was, respectable under Andy Dalton. Well, this Bears offense had been doing a really good job. They, I mean, they've been scoring a lot, right? And Caleb Williams been, Williams been playing better. But Lou was right. Like, Williams likes to back out of the pocket. And now when, he, there are a couple of times late, late in the game, when he got his rhythm, he stepped up a couple of times and saw some things. And so that's where he started to hurt him. But um, that's, you know, but that's, you know, and Lou had a, should have had two sacks, but it's hard to get him down. And I think you see that. And it's what makes him special. Um, and it's funny because sometimes he gets so far back that he had a couple scrambles like, oh, that looks like a 10, 12 yard gain. And it was only three to five yards because he's coming from so far deep that it made it, it made it, uh, it seemed it was a shorter run than I thought. So, um, but they did a good job. And I think they're starting to build it. There's still some issues there. And sometimes in the secondary, a little bit gave up some things. St. Juice with the penalty, with the pass interference penalty that put the ball on the one that led to the go ahead touchdown with, you know, what, 30 seconds left, something like that. And he also gave up a key third down on the slant and out. He bite a bit hard on the slant. The Bears like to do double moves and they got him on that for 15 yards. I think it was Odunze on that one. But, you know, it's funny because the other guy that didn't hurt them was Cole Komet. I thought he might be a guy that it could hurt him just because there's a lot of attention elsewhere and that and then he might do something, but he really didn't. And then DJ Moore had two catches for 27 yards. His best play was a run. So like there were there were actually I take that back. He had the nice catch on the sideline. So I take that back. And that was the what that was for a 20. That was a 27 yard gain. That was a hell of a catch. Um but, you know, for the most part, they kept him in check. And uh, Samra still did a good job on him um, when he was on him. And, you know, I felt like for the most part, the secondary did a pretty good job. When Caleb Williams can buy time, it makes it difficult. But but they've got, you know, those penalties at the end. It's really hard to keep giving those up. And St. Juice gets called for a lot of penalties. We all know that. Um, but. But the defense was good for three quarters. Really, if they had lost this game, it would have been on the offense because you can't give up 15 points, only 15 points, and lose the game, right? And so, like, anytime you give up 15, you should win every time, right? So they did, but it took a, mir a near miracle. And now you have the Giants on the road next week. They're in a great position to start to not take control of this division because the Eagles are starting to play better. 
and looking, you know, like who the team you thought. But this team is coming. This team is there. And I think it's it could be it could end up to be a two team race in the end. And it's not the one team that you guys all hate and it will not be the Giants. But um, so but next week becomes a big game because you've got the momentum, you know, and and you're playing just you're playing well. They're going to be missing Thibodeau. He's he's out. So they're in a good spot. Now, the other thing is, as far as injuries goes, Cornelius Lucas was in a had a walking boot on his left foot as he was in the locker room. Very happy guy, but in a in a boot nonetheless, could not finish the game. I think he missed like the last quarter. That's a problem. But Brandon Coleman was in the concussion protocol today. I would I don't know what it's going to be looking like for him next week, but they definitely need him back. You can't have Trent Scott out there. Um, you know, if I'm the Giants, I'm putting Burns on that side and just going crazy. Um, he's just he's Scott, like he's a good third tackle coming in there when he does that. But I don't think as a starting tackle, you're going to want that. And um, so they, they're going to need one of those two, Coleman or Lucas, to get healthy for sure. And then, you know, here's the other thing. It's funny because I, I like telling you guys some of the stuff that they said. Like, again, I'll go back to Frankie Louvu about celebrating in that moment. I know I'm bouncing around, folks, but this is the kind of night it is. And your head's kind of spinning. You know, had to file the big story on, the again, the oral history with it. Give that a read. So there's just, but there's so much to process and there's so much stuff you forget that even happened in the game that I will go over for on my Tuesday podcast. And then also with Bram Weinstein, the voice commanders and I will do it. It's Tuesday night, 730 Eastern time. Join us there for the live stream. So we'll talk about all these other things that went wrong, whether it's, you know, other, you know, other, what, what they did well against Caleb Williams, what they did well in coverage, what they struggled with at the end. But one thing they didn't have do, a problem doing was celebrating. And here's, you know, here's one thing Louvu said and, and how we celebrate, go, celebrate. He goes, I didn't even know where to run or what to do. I see DQ. He was running on the field. I went straight to him. I was like, yeah, coach. Turned up with him. I see Jaden and Jeremy Reeves walking down the sideline with Bobby Wagner. I ran straight to him like, man, like that. Um, he said, we've been doing good work. So I'm super excited, man. So that's how they all are. And they, they use that word brotherhood a lot too. This is the kind of thing where that cements that even more. And that's why I think like you guys can be very excited about what's going on here um, for sure. And, um, you know, and again, I'll, I'm going to finish on just on, on, on Jaden Daniels, because what he did again with the rib injury and not knowing all week, if he's going to play and you wondered, like, I was always a lean toward him playing. But when I say that, it was like in the beginning of the week, it was probably a Monday morning, I'd say it's about 60% chance he played based on what you what I had heard from a couple of people. And so I thought it was 60. And then you hear Dan Quinn say week to week, I'm like, oh no, I don't know that it is 60. I'm going to drop that to under 55. Then there's no practice Wednesday or Thursday. Now it was planned, but you're still like, what does that mean? And then you get out. And so now you're on that 51. I think I told Kevin Sheen on the radio on Thursday or Friday, that it was like, I was like a 51, 52% lean toward him playing. And they did the whole subterfuge on Friday. And you're like, well, what is the, you know, they don't want to, I don't, I don't blame them for not wanting to put him out there when we're there, but what did it mean? And what, what did they see? And um, the fact that they didn't elevate Sam Hartman kind of was the final deal. We're like, okay, I think he's going to play, but I always lean to that because guys like him just do special things. And, um, Sometimes you can't play with an injury, but if it's close, you know, he's going to go. And I just, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, all the stuff that happens in this game and the funny that it's Tariq Stevenson who ends up um, uh, tipping the ball. He's the one who tipped the ball. And if, I'm sure you saw he and Terry McLaurin had a little bit of a back and forth a couple of times, McLaurin yelling him at, yelling at him after a play, like you ain't bleep. And then after, I think it was on the, one of the next plays that Stevenson broke one or, defendant one in the end zone and um, was pretty excited about it. But I saw McLaurin actually wait for him and exchange something words and they slapped hands. So who knows, but just an exciting all around night here, folks. I hope you guys don't forget this. You fans deserve this because you've been waiting for something special for so damn long. So I'm happy for you guys. Um, enjoy it. Keep drinking, you know, see this in one in your dreams. And then get ready for next week because there's still 
nine more games and there's a lot more this team can do so anyway folks that's it for me again i'll be back tuesday morning with a wrap up just kind of going over some more of the plays and then tuesday night live stream with bram weinstein the voice of the commanders join us there bring your excitement because that's what it should be right now i'll talk to you next time folks